Hebraic year. And the 13th sabbatical reading begins the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus. Greetings, peaceful Sabbath, peaceful send that day. This is the 13th. We're now entering the 13th uh, Sabbath in our Hebraic, our Hebraic year. And the 13th Sabbatical reading begins the book of Exodus, the book that's known as Exodus, which is called in the Hebrew, it's called in the Hebrew uh, Shemot, Shemot or Shemoth, according to some pronunciations of the of the Hebrew, based on the pointing of the nukat or the voweling. But we call it Bamarinya in the Amharic, the world Amharic of Kadamawi, Haila Selase. We call it Simoch, Simoch which means the names. So the book actually begins, Ele Simot, or these are the name in the Z, Simoch in the Z Nacho, or Simoch in the Z in the Z, Simoch Nacho. In other words, these are the names according to the, to the alignment of the Hebraic and the, and the Royal Amharic or the Ethiopic. Now, the book of Exodus, the Orit Zemusi, or the Torah reading, the portion is from Exodus chapter 1, verse 1, to Exodus chapter 6, verse 1. And the Biyad, or the Haftarah reading, is Isaiah chapter 27, verses 6, to Isaiah chapter 28, verse 13, as well as Isaiah chapter 29, verses 22 to 23. And then from the New Covenant, or the, what's known as New Testament, or the Adis Hadis Kidan, or the Burt Chadasha, we have Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, verses 17 to verse 35, and 1 Corinthians, chapter 14, verses 18 to 25. So we've completed the, the sabbatical readings for the book of Genesis, and now we're beginning the sabbatical readings that are in the book of Exodus, beginning with this the 13th Sabbath in our Hebraic year. So this is how we study the Bible, basically. The first basic study of the Bible is beginning with the beginning of the Bible, but in the true Hebraic fashion, we cover also the Biyad of the Prophets, what's known as the Haftarah, as well as New Covenant readings, or the Hadis Kidan, the Burt Chadasha readings as well. But what we've been studying and focusing on mainly is the realignment according to the Ethiopic Genesis. That's how we had began with the the Torah scroll readings from the Ethiopic Genesis because we recognize that the true context of the Metaf or the scriptures must be read according to the wisdom of the author. And the author of the first five books of the Bible is our Coptic Hebraic brother Moshe or Musa, Moses. And Moses, as Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, verse, I think, 22, it states that uh, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egypts, or falsely translating the King James, Egyptians, and he was mighty in word and in deed. So he was mighty in both word as well as the deed. So in beginning Exodus, and what we're going to call the Ethiopic Exodus, as we called it, the Ethiopic Genesis, in order to put it into its proper context and we can do the, the real hermeneutic or the real interpretation in the context of the author. And this is what um, 
by and large Gentile Christianity or, or the Western, white Western, Anglo-Saxon Protestant tradition that comes out of the Roman Catholic, the mother of the Protestants is the Roman Catholicism. Yes, the Reformation did do some good, but it didn't go far enough. But this was all prophesied scripturally. When we look at the seven churches that I mentioned, it speaks about the Protestant Reformation in spirit and in type. But let's first address the Ethiopic Exodus. So this is going to begin off on the Ethiopic Exodus. And this is the second book of Musa, the second book of Moses, and Musa, Bamarinya, in the Ethiopic, it means, it's a title actually. Musa is a title in Ethiopic. And Musa, which is the anglicized Moses, and Hebraic they say Moshe, means, according to the Ethiopic, it means the head of a fraternal order. The head of a fraternal order, the head of a brotherhood order. So this also gives us much clarity in the true identity of the biblical Moses when we interpret it from the true Kamite mythos and the ancient Egyptian wisdom or the, the, the rightful school of the wisdom. Because what Moses did, and this is where Moses has been maligned by many who have not been initiated in the Ethiopic Genesis, therefore they would not know the Ethiopic Exodus in order to put it into its proper context. One who did do great work at putting it into its true context was one named Gerald Macy, and we referred to him during the period of the, the 12 sabbatical readings that were for the Ethiopic Genesis. So we did touch on Gerald Macy in many different places as his references helped to give clarity and context along with the Met of Kedus of Nagus and Neges, or the revised Amharic Bible of Kedemawi Haile Selassie for us as Ethiopian Hebrews and elect Rastafari. So now we're going to cover the Ethiopic Exodus. So let's begin off. First of all, we're going to have to do an overview of Exodus. What does Exodus mean? Now your, your job or, or your homework, in other words, is to read through Exodus chapter 1, verse 1, to Exodus chapter 6, verse 1, which is the sabbatical reading, which is a sabbatical study. This is the Sabbath reading, right? And as you do that, you will find there's much area for investigation in order to really comprehend the story in its proper context. Then there's some references that we would like to compile and make that will help ones to refer to, say, the works of Gerald Macy, who was one who recognized that the true interpretation of the Bible was from an African perspective and not an Aryan perspective. He pointed out that where European Christians and many of the Christians of his time and other scholars had it wrong was because they had the European madness. In other words, there's a European madness and state of mind that really avoids the African genesis or the Ethiopic genesis because of this, this sickness called racism and this bias and arrogance and everything else that, uh, that accompanies it. And much of Gerald Macy's work was set at a realignment of the, the truth of what is in the Bible based on its true origins out of Egypt. And he was roundly... Um, criticized by many Europeans who disagreed with him, one by Helena Blavatsky, her disciple Annie Bassan, which did the Lucifer magazine. They all, you know, tried to gang up on him, but he held his ground and squarely told them that the true interpretation of the Bible was not from the north of the so-called Aryan philosophies and teachings and misconceptions, but actually comes out of Africa. And this is very significant, and many of his, of his conclusions, we find, were accurate, or at least they were pointing in the right direction. Unfortunately, he didn't have the opportunity to really go even much deeper into the true African origins to find what we know today as the Ethiopic Genesis. But in his work concerning the book of Exodus, or concerning actually Egypt, and 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 um, <clears throat> you could say Egyptology, trying to realign Egyptology to its original, its true 
context origin and therefore the Bible and the Hebrews to their true origin out of Egypt and out of the Kamite mythos, he has shown us much insight that we would like to reference um, some of his works, such as um, Ancient Egypt, Light of the World, Natural Genesis, um, Book of Beginnings, as well as uh, Gerald Macy's lectures, which were one of the last works that he did. But if one would go to the the main works he did, they'll find much um, illumination for these studies and would better understand or overstand what we mean by Ethiopic, the Ethiopic Genesis. In other words, the genesis and Ethiopic uh, origins of the book that we know as the Bible and much of the confusion in Christianity and even Judaism has been caused because of the racial bias that has misinterpreted and taken the Bible out of its proper context and the stories out of the proper context and so-called mythos or mythology out of its proper context and therefore have given a false rendering you understand, to the true biblical, the Judaism, as well as the, Christ, the, the Christianity, the story of the Bible. So this is just some background that we like to refer to ones, some other materials and subject matters that they can hopefully study on their own. You understand, because most of what people know about Exodus and the book of Exodus, for example, in the West, and many of us even formerly, you know, this is what we thought was based on the Charleston Heston movie and the, and the Bible and, you know, a lot of the, the whitewashing, what we call the whitewashing of Christianity, especially in regards to this, this very important area of Scripture, which is known as the second book of Moses called Exodus, in which we re-entitle it for our studies here as the Ethiopic, the Ethiopic Exodus. Now, Exodus in and of itself, it means going out, going out. Exodus means going out. And this book, it records the redemption out of what has been known and called Egyptian bondage. And we have to put this into context because there's a lot of speculations of what the Egyptian bondage actually was, what was bondage in Egypt. And most people think that the bondage in Egypt was where so-called black people had white Jews in Egypt. The black, the big bad boogeyman black um, Egyptians had, you know, lily white Ashkenazis and Khazars enslaved in Egypt. That is a wrong interpretation that's a false bottoming out of the real mythos. So Gerald Macy helps us to understand what that Egyptian bondage actually referred to and, and the connection with the Purim Kharui or the coming forth by day and by night. Which bondage were the Hebrews or Egypt? The, 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 the bondage of Egypt basically was a spiritual or religious bondage and it's very important for us to understand there was a spiritual what's known as a spiritual bondage so when revelation speaks about spiritual egypt it has very much to do with the proper the proper interpretation of what the egyptian bondage was in the second book of the bible known as exodus so exodus the going out it records a redemption out of egyptian bondage of the descendants of abraham and sets forth in type, in and according to its mythos or mythological type, all redemption. Now, those who may not be uh, familiar with our use of the word mythos or the true meaning of mythos, mythos is basically a story, a story or or a a a a, a parable. The best way to really describe the word mythos is to use the Hebrew mishle or the Amharic and Ethiopic misale, a parabolical story you know, that has a wisdom. It can also be seen on some level as double talk in the sense that there is a there can be a literal interpretation of it, but really there's really more of a metaphorical interpretation, but it uses some literal literal descriptions and descriptive. We call it like a verbal hieroglyphs. It's like verbal hieroglyphs in a sense where the hieroglyphs actually showed um, um, images, but these images 
which became words and sounds and words, also encoded and embodied deeper ideas. So the real idea of myth or mythos, when we use it, it's referring to the mystir or the mystery or the ancient mystery, which were the wisdom schools. Now, Musa, Moses, being learned in all of the wisdom of the Egypts, because there were two Egypts, upper, what's known as upper and lower Egypt, but then there's also the upper celestial and the lower Egypt, the Egypt of the so-called underworld, and that Egypt of the underworld or the so-called land of the dead was that Egyptian bondage on the religious and the spiritual level. So much of what we have in the book of Exodus concerning Bondage in Egypt has to do more with the spiritual and religious level. Remember what it says about the Bible that, that the natural man that cannot receive the things of God because they must be spiritually interpreted and spiritually discerned. So there is a spiritual discernment which is necessary to really understand what does the Egyptian bondage mean and should not be confused with so-called slavery in the Americas. You understand the real bondage for the African Americans was not just with the stocks and the bonds and the chains and coming over here. That was one level of, one can call it bondage or slavery. The real bondage is the bondage that lost sheep, so-called Negroes, are under now where they don't recognize their true, their true identity and where they are so caught up in a false mind state. You understand in white supremacy what we know as white supremacy and a Gentile way of thinking, that they don't know themselves. You understand? And then so many um, um, different so-called denominations, denomination of Christianity and everybody else's so-called religion. Really, it's their way of life. Christianity and Judaism comes out of the Hebrew and Judaic peoples, but because of that spiritual bondage, they don't know that when they're reading the Bible concerning the Israelites, most Negroes don't know they're really talking about themselves and their ancestors and their own people. So when they're reading the Bible, they think they're talking about some other people because of brainwashing and because of, of the perversion of the scripture, the biblical story, because it has been um, reinterpreted, you understand, through European eyes and through European philosophies and white man's white man's religion and white man's interpretation. It's our way of life. You understand? Know but they don't see themselves because they don't identify themselves. They think of themselves as Gentiles because of that spiritual bondage that they have been programmed that they are Gentiles. You understand? Know Even though the whole experience of black people especially in the Americas, so my Afro-Americans and so forth, in the Americas and the Caribbean, really is the experience of the Beit Israel, as well as the prophecy that we have later on in the book of Deuteronomy, especially Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 to verse 68. And verse 68 says that they will go into Egypt again by way of ships. And this is where it now connects with us here in the Western Hemisphere. You understand the so-called Ethiopian Hebrews, Lord Sheep, the Philosophers of the West in the Western Hemisphere. So, this book, Exodus, the going out, or the going forth, which is similar to the Per Im Haru, the coming forth, the going forth, it records the redemption of, out of Egyptian bondage, or spiritual bondage, the spiritual, the El Elohe Israel exists. So all relationships exist within this type and context with the true and the living God, or what we know as the God of the Hebrews, the God of the Ibrawiyan, the God or the Elohim, the Elohe of the Hebrews. Now, moving on, broadly, Broadly speaking, and we're referencing the Schofield reference of the study Bible here and giving additional annotation and illumination on certain parts that are not addressed here through the Memphis Caduce. It says that the book teaches, speaking of Exodus or Zetzat, it teaches that redemption is essential to any relationship with a Caduce Amlak, with a holy God. That re redemption is an essential, is essential, in other words, an essential element to any relationship, 
relationship. Remember these key words, the certain key words that if you understand it as you get into the, the sabbatical studies and sabbatical readings, it will start to make the picture really very much more clear. And one of the main words connected with the book of Exodus or the Ethiopic Exodus is redemption. Redemption. So the book teaches that redemption is essential to any relationship with a holy God, a Kedus Elohim. And that even a redeemed people, even a people who have been redeemed, cannot have fellowship. What is fellowship? Fellowship is like brotherhood, like that association, that fellowship, when the Mamachnet with him, unless constantly, unless they are constantly cleansed from defilement because he is kedus, he is holy. Therefore, we cannot have fellowship with him unless we are constantly, the principle that is taught in the book of Exodus, unless we are constantly cleansed from defilement. Now, in Exodus, in Zet'at, or what's known as Shemot or Simoch, based on the first words in the Hebrew, the names, in other words. In Exodus, Elohim Baruchu, here hitherto connected with the Hebrew or the Israelitish, the Hebrew, the Hebrew people only, through his covenant with Abraham. Now, Joe Macy points out some very interesting highlights from the Kamite mythos and the and the ancient wisdom of the Egyptians, which of course, Musa, Moses, must have been learned in, according to Acts of the Apostles, that really shows that in Exodus, Elohim, or the true God, hitherto connected with the Israelitish people. Who are the Israelite-ish people? Ish meaning, meaning man, or Israelite man people, or the Hebrew, the Hebrew people only. Why the Hebrew people only? Because see, the Hebrew people in ancient Egypt were really racially not indistinguishable from the native, the native Kamite, the native Egyptians. And we're speaking about the true Egyptians. In other words, they both were black peoples, for lack of a better word. They both were African or Ethiopianish people, in other words. So he was connected with the Israelitish people only through his covenant with Abraham. Abraham. And brings them to himself nationally. Abraham connected with the Atum. Brings them to himself nationally now. Now as a Behir, as a nation, nationally through redemption. He puts them under the Mosaic covenant. Under the Mosaic covenant and dwells amongst them in the cloud, in the cloud of the cover or the cloud of glory. Now, Galatians in the New Testament, the book of Galatians, it explains our Coptic Hebrew, another Coptic Hebrew brother who was even likened to Musa or Moses in the New Testament is our brother Hawari of Paulos. You see, and all this is connected with that ancient Mishtir. This is why many people misunderstand and misinterpret Paul and even try to assume that Paul was a false apostle because they are wrongly reading and interpreting the New Testament because they don't have a true foundation of the context of the Old Testament. But Galatians explains the relation of the law, what the relation of the law to the Abrahamic covenant is. In the commandments, Elohim taught Israel his just demands. See, it's through the commandments, the why the commandments, according to Hawariya Paulos, he says that the the law is our schoolmaster until Christ comes. Now, some people think that means, well, since Christ already came, therefore we put away the law, but they're misinterpreting it. You see, the true interpret the law is our mogzi. It's a child conductor. Like when we're born again, the law is very important. You understand we study the commandments because the commandments, the experience now under the commandments, it convicted its right. The law is holy. The law of God because the true law of our Father, it teaches us his just, convicts us of chatiyat, of missing priesthood now, and sacrifice. 
of the priesthood, what it, the sacrifice filled with the precious this book and the five books of Moses in order to be properly comprehended and understood must be understood from the point of view of the author of the book. So the experience under the commandments it convicts is Rael of Chatiyat and the provision of the Kahinat and Metzwa'it or priesthood and sacrifice which are filled with the precious types of it gave a guilty people the way of forgiveness, cleansing, restoration. This is very, very important. Thus learning what is the way of forgiveness. This particular note we would like to add a um a run of process. So it's kind of trickled down to us over here. So this particular time is the Christmas time. The Christmas season. Now, in the Christmas story, or the story of Christmas, they say that when Christ was born, that his star was seen, right? Around the time that he, that he was about to be born, his star was seen, and the Magi, the Magi, which they erroneously tried to limit to three, but based, based on the gifts. But anyway, the Magi, the wise check, similar to our situation even today, if you look at it. But what's very interesting about the story according to the New Testament and what Christianity, the Western Christianity teaches us, and it's somewhat accurate based on the Bible, but the timing is off, but they tell us it happened in this particular time, you know, this season of the year where we're about to approach the so-called, um, actually, it's on the 25th, which is a Sabbath, you understand, that the sabbatical reading actually, interesting about this is that in the story it speaks about the, massacre and the murder of the innocents. Remember the children? Some say it was 144,000 who were massacred. You know, the, the innocents or the massacre of the little children because Herod was after the Christ child. He was massacring all the children who were in a certain region and under it for a moment. People think that, well, this is the time that Christ was born, but really according to the mythos, it was more the time that most this Christmas seasons when Christ, New Testament, we say, no, it's not the Mashiach that was born at this time, but it really refers to the Moshe or the Moses that was born at this time. So we're seeing an alignment of these things even right now within this 2010 where the Sabbath, the Shabbat, actually occurred according to the scriptural type than to the Messiah at this time. So the world says happy Christmas, but really we should be saying happy birth of Moses because Moses is about to be born in this very season right now according to Torah, according to Orit. So it's not the Mosheah that is born, but it's the Moshe, the original Old Testament type that was born, and we have the self-similar situation of the massacre of the innocents. And they were thrown into the river being aborted and massacred because of that new king that rose that did not know Yosef, that did not know Joseph, which is the innocence time and that flight. Notice it's around the same time in the, in the Christianities where after the birth of Christ is a fleeing or a flight of Joseph, uh, Christianity and Victorian Egyptology to be. Then we have a next portion in chapter 2. We have the preparation of the deliverer and the birth of Moses. So this Christmas season, which we just came through, which is a war, that is the time the, the Ethiopic perspective and the birth of Christ was in the season, some believe, in some Judaisms and some Christianities that they believe that was. Moses identifies himself with Israel, even though he's brought up in Pharaoh's. Moses is redeemed faith. 